<clears throat> Hello. Hello, everyone. Can I get an audio check? And uh, can y'all tell me if I'm doing YouTube right at the moment? Because I'm trying to do YouTube right. Um, we'll see if I get it right. So, welcome. Let's talk about this. If you haven't been paying attention to Facebook or any of the uh, fish and wildlife uh, Facebook pages or websites or anything like that, um, there's some, there's some panic. There's some craziness we we need to talk about these zebra mussels. So I thought I'd come on live and let you guys tell me what you want to talk about. So we can talk about zebra mussels and what they are. We can talk about what they've been doing invasive wise since the 1980s. We can talk about what moss balls are. We can talk about what aquatic arts does with their moss balls. Whatever you guys want to talk about. So I'm going to say hi to some people here in the chat. Um, and then we're going to get started with some questions. So um, let's see. I got my mods here. Bob Kaler is here. Thank you, Bob. Let's see. We've got Joseph Stanley, Don Gallagher, Tiffany White, um, <clears throat> Meridol. Let's see. IS, IHSP, Skipper, Florida Fish Rescue, Science Gal Aquatics is here. Um, who else? Who else? Jess Shrimp Granny is here. Mary, <clears throat> Mary Page is here. Hello. I need to drink some more of my coffee. Um, we had an early question in the chat. Somebody asked um, if it would be okay. Who was it? Carla. Carla asked if it would be okay to add these to an Amazon puffer fish tank. I think she was talking about the zebra mussels. It's not a good idea to add these to your tank intentionally. Not a good idea. Um, so Jess Shrimp Granny just asked, what's going on with these mussels? I've not been paying attention to them. Okay, so the big situation is that um, zebra mussels have been found in moss balls. This is not super new, and if, and if you're getting your moss balls from a reputable source, it shouldn't be a problem because there should be quarantine practices in place. However, because they were found, I believe, at a PetSmart in some Betta Buddies moss balls, it's kind of become a thing that's going a little bit viral on um, Facebook. Um, going green mom says zebra mussels are killer on your feet in lakes. They absolutely are super, super sharp shells. They can cut your feet if you walk on them. They're super invasive, but I think they're not so much of a problem to us as hobbyists because of the way that we should be keeping our aquariums. Nothing from your aquarium should ever, ever enter your waterways. You shouldn't be dumping it into your creek out back. N none of that. So it really shouldn't be an issue for us if we are practicing things correctly. However, there are some conservation things that we have to keep in mind, and most of them have to do with boats when we're talking about zebra mussels. So uh, the fish, fish box says, hello, all. We have them in the UK, too. Yeah. They actually were introduced into the Great Lakes region, which is the thing I'm the most familiar with because I'm from that area, <clears throat> in like the 1980s through ballast water from big ships from Europe. Boats and moving water from one body of water to another is really the way that these things become a serious, serious problem for like power treatment plants and water treatment facilities and things like that. Um, they can be really hard on the native mussels, and they've actually caused eradication of some species. But this has been going on since the 80s. It's not a new thing. And most of the problem is in boats. <clears throat> what else do we got going on in this chat? Let's see. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Everybody saying hi. Hello, everyone. We got raids going on. You guys are awesome. What else do we have here? <clears throat> Florida Fish Rescue says, amen to that. Aquarium animals do not belong in natural environments. Anything that you're moving from something that's not its natural environment should not be going into your natural environments. And even on that same page, if you have taken something out of nature and brought it into your aquarium, that thing can then not go back into the wild because you don't know what new thing you may have introduced to it. It's not just a situation where it's, parasites and animals and things like that. There could be bacteriums that you don't know about, algaes that aren't native to that area. You, you should never put 
anything from your aquarium into nature where it can co-mingle with your natural in, in your natural environment. <clears throat> T-Bone says I dump my fish tank water down the toilet. That may or may not be a great idea. Depending on where your toilet goes. I mean, technically, most of these things go through to a water treatment facility plant. Whatever. So you got to think about that. A lot of people will take their aquarium water and use it for house plants, to water house plants. They'll use it to water gardens. You can dump it into your yard as long as your yard doesn't have, isn't real close to some drainage areas or waterways or anything like that. <clears throat> Let's see. Kevin says, GRB said he can't keep any shrimp at all. It's illegal. I think he lives in Australia. So Some things are illegal in different places. There's a lot of people that won't allow you to keep dwarf species of crayfish here in the United States. We can't keep Asian arowanas like they can in Canada. And it's all basically something happens and then a bunch of people get together and try to decide how best to fix it. And one of the easiest things they can do is put regulations on things like our aquarium hobby. They can put regulations on boats, which is basically what they did for the zebra mussel situation. Um, it's the IMO convention. They actually ratified it in 2017 and entered it into force because enough countries got together with it, which puts a bunch of stipulations on how you can flush ballast water from your boats and things like that. So that's how they're strongly combating the spread of this invasive muscle and every different invasive thing is different like if i had an asian arowana here in indiana and i was a horrible horrible person and decided to throw it into a waterway it's not going to survive our winter however there are places it could survive the winter so they just did a blanket ban on them throughout the u.s <clears throat> it's not fun it's not technically fair for people that would keep them responsibly but it's what they did and in order to keep them from doing anything crazy with our moss balls, which are perfectly safe if dealt with the correct way, we need to not let this become a situation where everyone's afraid of moss balls. Because the easiest thing to do would just be to say no more moss balls. But that's ridiculous, because if you're doing the right things with them, you shouldn't have a problem. Uh, do, 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 do. Science Gal Aquatics waters her garden and raspberries. That's a great idea. <clears throat> IHSB says my tank water goes on the trees uh, or my dill patch by the driveway. All good ideas. Um, let's see. What else do we got? Dragon layer puts drained water on potted plants. The rest goes on the weeds. There you go. What else do we got? Got to be sure. Fish room fever says got to be sure piranha don't breathe up north. <laughs> good one. Kevin says, I thought Asian arowana was because they are more endangered. That's part of it, too. I mean, it depends on who you ask what the reason is. Some people will say the reason is because they're endangered. Some people will say the reason is because they're invasive. <clears throat> Depending on what the species is, there could be multiple reasons. Uh, Florida Fish Rescue says, nearly every law we have is because there's always one moron that ruins it for the rest of us. That happens with all things fishing. With all things nature one person abuses it and then the whole community steps up and goes if you're gonna abuse what we love we're not gonna let you do any of it which is admirable but it also hurts people that are doing things responsibly <clears throat> all right so what do we want to talk about here kevin says they're being found on moss balls and the muscles are invasive okay so let's talk about these invasive muscles in these moss balls <clears throat> Aquatic Arts has not found one live mussel in our shipments. We have found them. They are all dead. They are dead because we put our moss balls through a stringent quarantine process to ensure that not just the mussels, but anything that is living inside of them does not end up in your fish tank. That's just step one in a it's good practice if you're going to be importing things from other countries. It's good practice if you're going to be housing things that are alive where the spread of bacteria, parasites, <clears throat> any kind of invasive species is going to be a problem. So if you're an importer, <clears throat> you should already be doing that. I have to drink some coffee because I can't keep talking. Um, do, 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 do. 
Going good. Moss balls. That makes more sense. I was hearing moth balls. Yeah, no, it's moss balls. They're moss balls. They're actually a type of Claudophora algae. <clears throat> it's a filamentous green algae. And they're from like Japan and Europe and Ukraine, all over the place. Kevin says, how would you suggest you quarantine plants, i.e. snails and snail eggs on plants? Well, first of all, I don't think snails are a problem. I am pro-snail. So if you are getting in plants and you are worried about getting snails, I'm not really the person to ask for that. However, you can always do different kinds. A lot of people use like potassium permanganate and some people use uh, salt dips. Some people just quarantine to see if anything pops up. They'll put it in like a bowl of water near the you know window or something like that. <clears throat> you just really have to. It all starts with where are you buying it from? If you're buying your aquatic supplies from a reputable source that has good quarantine practices, you're probably fine to just do a week quarantine, wait and see, make sure everything's fine, move on with your life. If you are purchasing stuff through eBay, from other people's houses, from places you don't know, from whatever, you need to have a quarantine system in place for that. Like, for instance, and it, and it all depends on how worried you are about the system you're putting, whatever you're putting in to like my normal aquariums like where I have my shrimp and things like that if I'm putting something new in there it goes through a two-week quarantine and I don't even treat that quarantine tank I just basically hold the thing in a different volume of water and see what happens until I put it in my actual tanks now with my rope fish project like with this rope fish pond nothing touches this pond for six months six month quarantine on anything plant invertebrate anything that goes into here, new rope fish, all of that. Because this project is so important to me that if I introduce one tiny little thing, it's really going to affect my life, my projects, my, my, my goal. So I really try to put this under a lot more scrutiny than I do my other tanks. <clears throat> IHSP says... I've heard freezing plants for 24 hours might kill snails, mussels, and other things. How hard would that be on most plants? Freezing a plant for 24 hours is probably going to do some serious damage, if not kill it. It is, it is very hard on a plant. Now, the moss balls, that when we bring them into quarantine, they actually stay, they're shipped dry, and then they stay in their boxes for like two to three weeks, which pretty much kills anything that's in there. And then they go into a high salinity bath, like, and I'm talking 60% above seawater high salinity bath, which is going to kill everything, even the brackish stuff that goes into it. But it doesn't kill the moss ball as long as it doesn't last longer than 24 hours. After 24 hours, in that high of a salt content, it'll kill the moss ball. Uh... John says, are marmo balls the same as moss balls, same species? Yes. I can't pronounce the actual name of this very well. It's Agarophila linnae, I think is how it's pronounced. A-E-G-A-G-R-O-P-I-L-A and then L-I-N-N-A-E-I. -N -N -E it's actually Greek for goat hair, which is hilarious. Bob, I saw your super sticker. I'm so sorry. I was ranting. Thank you. I love you. Um, okay, what else? Let's see. Reels Tank's got a puffer that moves from tanks to tank and loves snails. There you go. You can get a traveling puffer and just travel them around to your fish tanks and get rid of all your pest snails. That'll work. Oh, do 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 do. What else? Florida Fish Rescue says Coopermine kills invertebrates, including mussels. Mussels. I dose Coopermine to all new fish and plant arrivals. That's a good idea. That's one of the things that we have in our quarantine process is coopermine. You'll want to uh, rinse those thoroughly because they can be detrimental to your invertebrates in your tank, your snails, shrimps, that kind of thing. Um, but as long as you get the coopermine out before you put the plants in, that is a great way to kill anything invasive that's going to be on there. Do, 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 do. Geek Boy says, I don't think freezing the zebra mussels for 24 hours is going to kill them. They're from Russia, and they invaded several of our lakes in Colorado and survive our winters. That all depends. They are really good at handling extreme temperatures. Those zebra mussels can live outside of water for up to seven days, and they can handle extreme temperature fluctuations. 
but being frozen solid is not something that most things can come back from. <clears throat> T-Bones fishes with the $2 super chat. Thank you. Awesome. That's cool. This guy goes like this. That's awesome. Okay. All right. What else are we talking about? What else? Uh, Kevin says, I would also think the eggs are still on them. If you're talking about snail eggs, you would be correct. If you're talking about zebra mussel eggs, they don't lay eggs. They release sperm and eggs into the water. Um, and after two days, there are free swimming microscopic larvae. Up to a million a year from one zebra mussel female. That's why they're so invasive. Jess Shrimp Granny says, can you eat zebra mussels? Um, they're very small. Max size on these things is two inches. So we're talking about something that's like this big. Not a very big thing to be eating. I'll tell you what does eat them though. Crayfish. Crayfish like to eat zebra mussels and they can, an adult crayfish can eat 105 zebra mussels a day. So one of the things that places like, I think Utah was looking at it and possibly Idaho were looking at using zebra, um, native crayfish to try to combat some of the zebra mussels they have. Uh, John says, I guess vodka wouldn't kill them either if they're from Russia. Well, Europe, Russia, the Ukraine, Japan, they're not just from Russia. They're kind of from that whole, and technically they're all over the world at this point. Even Ireland has problems with these things, eradicating native mussel and clam species because they like to attach to the hardest surface they can find. And one of those surfaces is like the water treatment plants and the power facilities, but also things like boats, which is why you need to clean your boat. And they like to attach to other clams and mussels. And from the thumbnail picture, if you see, they'll actually colonize on top of a mussel or a clam, a native one, so bad that they'll kill it. And they'll outcompete the native mussels and clams for algae because these things can filter up to a liter of water a day per mussel. So they're actually making the water a lot cleaner, even though they are destroying the native ecosystem. Because they're really good at eating detritus and plankton and algae and all that stuff in the water. That's what they eat. Which is generally why they wouldn't get super prolific in your aquarium. Because, number one... It takes them seven weeks after they attach before they'll start breeding. And number two, there's probably not enough detritus in your tank to sustain anywhere near a giant colony of these things. They would just start dying off. Yeah, it's insane how well they clean the water. Like, if they weren't so invasive and such a problem by attaching the things that are in the water and cutting people's feet and just being horrible in general, they would be a great filtration source. <clears throat> J-Rad Iron Man says zebra mussel is native to the Black Caspian and Azov Seas. Correct. That is correct. Let's see. What else do we got here that I've missed while I've been rambling with my rambling? Um, somebody was, oh, I think it was, that's my mother talking about the toxins that are in them. They will hold toxins, which can cause problems for like big fish and stuff that eat them or try to eat them. Because if they've got enough toxic stuff built up in their system, it can cause the fish and stuff to get sick. That's a little more rare, but <clears throat> still, same deal. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, Dragon Lair says they would have to be clean cultured to be able to eat them. Correct. You wouldn't want to eat one that's out in the middle of, you know, Lake Superior or something. Because who knows what it's been filtering out of the water. But if you brought them in and you cleaned them out really good, I mean, I suppose you could eat them. Do, 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 do. Bob Kaler's Aquatics throwing down my uh, coupon code for Aquatic Arts. If you have any aquatic needs, you can check out AquaticArts.com. Use coupon code ODDBALL15 for 15% off your first purchase. And code ODDBALL10 for 10% off your second purchase. That's the last time I'll do a commercial. I promise I really hate doing it. Florida Fish Rescue says, we have estuaries here in Florida that fish and wildlife are dredging out by the ton and sacrificing native species in the process, hoping the natives can reestablish. The and fish and wildlife will do all kinds of crazy things to eradicate stuff. They'll, they'll use chemicals. They will dredge entire river systems and ponds and lakes. And the, they're on it. 
they spend like the power plants and water treatment plants alone spend like almost five hundred million dollars a year trying to eradicate just this one species, and that's just one of the invasive species. Anywho, what else? What else can we talk about? What else would make you guys feel better about the fact that we are conservationists as hobbyists? A lot of us breed fish that would be extinct if we weren't breeding them in our tanks. We do everything we can to bring nature into our homes and try to learn about it and help it and grow it. We're basically all of the fairies in Fern Gully. That's what we are. We're helping it to grow, right? And none of us, at least the fish keepers that I know, want to feel like we're doing anything bad to nature. And I promise you guys, you're not doing anything bad to nature by owning moss balls, as long as you already treat your aquarium responsibly. You're not doing anything to go against the conservation of your natural habitats. You're not... You're not doing anything wrong. Just buy your aquatic supplies from a reputable source. Buy them from people who do the right things in our hobby versus just trying to make money. And you will be absolutely fine. <laughs> uh, let's see. Dragon Lair said, I read it's closer to a billion now. I read a couple different reports this week on the amount of money that the water treatment plants spend. And like some of the conservative ones say it's like 267 million and some of them say like 500 million. And then you've got the ones that are just all the way at the top of the you know craziness that say it's close to a billion. But some of those are talking about multiple species. It's The information is really hard to pin down because there's so many different agencies working on it. You have the EPA, you have the Division of Fish and Wildlife, you have the local divisions of Fish and Wildlife, and all of them have their own reports and studies and things that they've seen and things that they haven't seen. It just gets a little convoluted. <clears throat> Florida Fish says, totally agree. There are a lot of aquatic fish that would be extinct if it wasn't for rust. Correct. And, like, even, even when we do things like pulling fish out of the wild and keeping wild-caught fish, all of my rope fish are wild-caught. But I'm not keeping them so that I can look at them and go, oh, that's a pretty fish. I'm keeping them because I'm trying to get them to breed in aquariums so that we can stop pulling them from their natural habitats. <clears throat> ah, do 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 Let's see. Fish Dreams has a question just about her fish. It says, I had a suspicion that I got hemorrhagic septicemia in my tank. Three fish died. No other fish show issues. No new fish added. How to kill that and how would that pop up? Depending on what caused it, it could have been anything. That could have been some fish that got into a fight and got hurt and there was a bacteria that they weren't able to fight off. As long as there's nothing else happening in your tank, I would just wait and see. Maybe add some catapa leaves. That might help. Catapa leaves have some like antibacterial properties that'll help you out there. The tannins are really good. That's the only thing I would see unless you can identify something else. I never like to treat a fish unless I can identify what I'm treating for and treat for that thing. I don't like to blanket treat anything. Um... Joshua says, as an aquatic arts moss ball reseller, how would you deal with the DFW or USDA if you're questioned about our Marimo? I would tell them exactly what we're doing. I would tell them about the quarantine process that everything goes through. And I believe um, the owner of the company has actually, it's, it's a kind of a trade secret quarantine process. But because of this whole situation, the owner of aquatic arts has actually shared that process with most of our wholesalers and our supplier. And our supplier has actually implemented the initial salt bath before the shipping process starts so that we can hopefully keep everything that's coming in from being alive before it even hits our borders. So we're doing a lot behind the scenes to try to make sure that everything is on point for this whole situation. But the way that I would deal with fish and wildlife if I was a wholesaler 
is I would let them inspect what I'm doing. And I would tell them what we're doing because that's what we did at Aquatic Arts. We brought Fish and Wildlife in. We said, here's what we're doing. Here's where we get it. Here's what we do with it. Here's what we found. And unlike a lot of people who are getting their moss balls confiscated, we were allowed to keep our stock. We you know, were told that they have no problem with what we are doing and they moved on. If you're doing everything right, there is no problem in telling the truth. If you have something to hide, maybe maybe you have a little bit of a problem. But if you have nothing to hide and you're doing everything on par, there's nothing to be worried about here because we're not doing anything that would hurt the ecosystem. Um, J Red says, have rope fish bred in aquariums or are you trying to be the first? Trying to be the first. There's been conflicting reports. Some people have got them to breed, haven't been able to keep the babies alive. It's convoluted. I have other videos about it. Ah, Ken's Fish says, you're awesome. Thanks so much for the info. I love how you express yourself with the info you provide. I'm just trying to tell you what I know. I've had to do a lot of research on this recently. I've done a lot of research on it in the past. If I have information that can help people and make people feel better about what they're doing in their aquarium, I absolutely want to share that. I generally am not an educational channel. I'm just trying to show people what I'm doing with my aquariums and what I do in my life and how to live your best life because that's all I ever try to do. But if I can educate a little bit, I have no problem doing that. Just know that I'm also a hobbyist. I This information is just from me spending several hours digging as deep as I could into a situation that I thought might affect my hobby or the hobby in general. 90% of our hobby is research, guys. We're researching when we're sitting in front of our tank watching them. We're researching when we're looking up parameters. We're researching when we're testing water. We're researching when we're looking up food. 90% of it is research. So if you don't like to learn things, you're in the wrong hobby. I like to learn things. So I dug into this pretty deep and I wanted to make, I, I want people to not be afraid. I want people to not think they're doing anything wrong. And I want you to know moss balls are awesome. They do a really good job of helping you filter the water. They're a plant that almost anybody can grow in no light, low light, small tank, big tank. I have five of them in with my Bashirs and they like to kick them around. These things grow five millimeters a year. They last forever. And, and they're, it's just an amazing little plant we have in our hobby and there's no reason to be afraid of it. <clears throat> Let's see. Fish Dream says, did I miss it? What's the best way to kill anything new on plants? Um, so we decided there's a couple ways. There's wait and see, salt dip, cupramine, potassium uh, permanganate. And I think that was it. <clears throat> you can also do a blackout. That works sometimes too. Do, 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 do. Florida Fish Rescue. I'm trying to be the first to get green spotted puffers to breed in captivity, so I'll make you a competition to see if I get the green spotted puffers before you get the ropes. Okay. I already bred the Shodentai puffer, so talk to me if you want to talk about puffers. We can talk puffers. <clears throat> uh, do, 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 do. Fish dreams. Rope fish seem to be doing good in the 90 gallon, but they don't seem to be growing. <clears throat> they eat a lot. They eat a whole lot. Like when I feed my rope fish, like just the standard feeding, not when they're getting like extra treats or, you know, I switch up the food for a day or whatever. Sometimes I switch to tilapia, but their standard is bloodworms. And each one of them will eat at least one cube a day. So if you have five rope fish, that's five cubes of bloodworms into your tank. They eat a lot to grow. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. Aquaball says, how about gobies? Can you breed them? I've never bred a goby. You can breed gobies. I know people who have bred gobies. Gobies are adorable. They have a lot of personality when you really start watching what they're doing when they're like hopping around on rocks and burying themselves in the sand. Adorable. <clears throat> Bob Kaler says, I decided against the rope axolotl combo. Okay, because I was waiting for you to tell me how you were going to get over the temperature issue. Bob Kaler was thinking about putting rope fish in with an axolotl, and I'm like, I don't understand how you're going to get the temperature low enough and high enough for those two species. He had an idea, but he wouldn't tell me about it. 
Uh, let's see what else we got here. Anybody else want to know anything else? We got about another half an hour <clears throat> here. Tiffany White with the $5 Super Chat. You do a great job of summarizing stuff that can be a bit complicated. Everything's complicated, Tiffany. Everything. Thank you for the $5 Super Chat. I love you. Um, isn't everything in our hobby complicated? Because you can sit there all day long and say, if you want a fish tank, you need a filter, a heater, and a bubbler, and then you let it cycle for two weeks, and then you put fish in it. That's like the standard two-sentence summary for our hobby. And you guys all know, and I know, and the rest of the world that's ever kept even just a bed of nose, it's so much deeper than that. You can go off in any direction in this hobby. You can go the hardcore, clean, filtered way. You can go the uh, natural way. You can keep big monster fish. You can keep little tiny fish, nano aquariums. It's planted. It's everything. Um, Joshua says, do you have a time frame on when Aquatic Arts will be selling Marmo again? As soon as we are able. As soon as we get all of the go-aheads and clearance and everything, they'll be back up. Which should be soon because we've already done the inspections and things like that. So I don't think it's going to take long. As long as the panic doesn't get any bigger. Because there's no reason to panic. But everybody that just jumps into it and hears zebra mussels in moss balls um, automatically is spreading the information. And, and spread of information is a good thing, but it needs to be curtailed to understand that we're not doing anything wrong by keeping moss balls. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, Jeff Rose. Did I just see Jeff Rose pop in here? I swear I saw a Jeff Rose. Oh, my gosh. Okay, what else do we see here? Rick Hunter, what are your thoughts on rope fish with Pandagara? I'm thinking since the Gara will be okay since they are so active and rarely stop moving around looking for second opinions. I think it will be fine. I think if you're not feeding the rope fish enough, they may try to eat the pandagaras. I don't think the pandagaras will bother the rope fish whatsoever. In fact, I have seen pandagaras kept with rope fish because Lucas Bretz from LRB Aquatics is actually keeping his rope fish, his three rope fish, in his 125 high with his pandagara co colony. There's Jeff Rose. I see you now. Yo, yo. SC Aquatics, thank you so much, sir, for being a good friend. Um, let's see what else. Fish Dream says I've been using salt more and more for issues. Salt is a very natural remedy for a lot of things. A lot of betta breeders use it. A lot of fish breeders use it. We use attached baby brine shrimp. Salt is not unheard of in the freshwater game. We still have to participate in the saltiness here in the freshwater game. <clears throat> Rick says, glad for the information. Glad to hear it might work well. Yeah, I think you could pull it off. Fishy Mon says, uh, I thought moss balls were algae. They are. They're Clodophora algae. They're not actually moss. If you have a moss ball, it is not moss. It is algae. However, it is a specific type of algae. It generally doesn't spread unless it's torn apart. So if you do have a moss ball and you want to tear it apart and look and see if there's anything in it or whatever you want to do with it, you can actually tear it apart and each little piece will create its own moss ball eventually. Or you can like glue it to things like trees and stuff and make like moss ball trees. It's actually a lot of fun. <clears throat> the pond's looking fantastic. I just did a big water change on it. And I pulled out a bunch of duckweed. You know what's pretty invasive? Duckweed. Duckweed's super invasive. Can't get rid of that stuff. But it's only invasive in my fish tanks. Oh, man, I need all this coffee. Okay, what else are we talking about? What else do we want to know about? Anybody else have moss ball questions, zebra mussel questions, rope fish questions, life questions? What's going on with you guys? Are you guys okay out there? 
Let me tell you what's going on with this beta breeding I got real quick. Uh, this male beta that I have, super jerk. I can't get him to stop beating up the female. So I got to keep her in a little container. Not a little container, but she's in a holding box inside the tank. And I just can't get him to calm down. He's so pretty and I want to breed him so bad, but he just will not stop. What's up with that? Do, 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 do. Moss ball algae looks so cool growing on driftwood. Yes, it does. Some people will just fill the whole bottom of a tank with those, especially if they have like some flow going over it, because that's how they grow in the wild is they just kind of pile up on the bottom of these lakes and rivers and stuff. And as the water like tumbles them around, it keeps them clean and aerated and all this stuff. It's actually pretty cool in the wild. <clears throat> Uh, Bob says someone told a fish fam member that clownfish could be acclimated to fresh. They can't. Have you heard this? I have not heard this. I am definitely not a salty. I am a novice when it comes to salty things. I do a lot of research on it, but I've never done any of it in practice. I find it interesting, the relationship between clownfish and anemones. So I've done a lot of research into that. But never really on changing. I know you can change um, mollies. Mollies, yeah, mollies back and forth between salt water and fresh water. But I never heard about it in a clownfish. <laughs> Color guppies, that's funny. Yeah, I'm not into the challenge of breeding bettas there, big city bettas. I'm not. I just. I need other projects to keep me distracted so that I'm not poking at my rope fish all the time. So that's why I do things like breed rainbow fish and breed bettas and breed plecos and breed bashirs and breed puffers. That's all distraction so that I'm not like constantly looking at my rope fish going, why aren't you breeding? Why? Please breed. <laughs> Uh, Florida Fish Rescue says salt actually increases resistance to a lot of things by causing a small amount of harm, much like golden seal tricks the human body into believing it's being attacked and increases white blood cells. Okay, right. That's, I can get that. It's also just really like antiseptic. Like think about like a long, long time ago, what they would use to like clean wounds and things like that. It's salt. Because not a lot of stuff can survive in high salinity. So therefore, it's very antiseptic. Do, 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 do. Salt can have long-term harmful effects on some fish. Everything in moderation. Everything can have bad long-term effects. If you feed one food all the time and it's missing something that that fish needs, even if it's the best food on the market, it can have bad effects. Variety is the key to life. If you do anything to excess, it can be a problem. If you eat a hundred apples a day, it can be a problem. But if you eat two apples a day or one apple a day, it can be beneficial. All of life is a balance. I'm a Libra. This is my motto, okay? Everything is a balance. Your fish tank, your life, your your personal matters, your your everything is all about balance. And if you skew too far one way, whether that way is good or bad, it becomes a problem somehow. Less is more is the best approach to salt. Less is more is the best approach to anything because you only need enough of something to do the job. That's why you shouldn't put a ton of toothpaste on your toothbrush. Because you need this much to do the job. And if you put this much on there, that, that's just too much toothpaste. And it's probably not going to cause a problem. But if you do it every day and you swallow it and you end up using a tube of toothpaste a week and that ends up inside your body, it can cause a problem. Everything in moderation. Do, do, do. Rocco's can't take it anymore. He's got to go get a cup of coffee. I recommend a cup of coffee before watching my live streams. 
I will always have some form of a cup of coffee with me. <laughs> do 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 do. Florida Fish Rescue says nothing removes salt. Even 50% water changes. You're only diluting it. If you're diluting it, you're removing part of it. But you're correct. That's true for nitrates too. If you do, let's say you do a 50% water change. That doesn't mean that you're remo removing all of the nitrates and cleaning the water. That means that you're removing 50% of the nitrates. And when you add the water back in, you will then be at a 50% concentration of the amount of nitrates that were originally in the system. Do, 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 do. Yeah, everybody get some coffee. I know, I know that I just made everybody go on a coffee run. Um, Myrtle says, cleaning wounds, curing meats or other food items, items, saline solutions, aquarium dosages, salt is used in many scenarios to clean. Yeah, the, the, when you get an IV at the doctor, that clear bag that they put everything into, that they put the medicines into, that where they say, oh, we're going to run a bag of saline into you just to hydrate you. It's electrolytes and salt. That is what that is. Because our bodies require a certain amount of it just to stay alive. Coffee is required for life. Agreed. First, coffee. Second, knowledge. What's going on with Fishymon? Fishymon, too much ice cream is not bad. Too much ice cream is not bad, but it can be bad if that's all you eat. Um, do, 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 do. James says, talk about white spot on rope fish again, just briefly, please. Okay, so white spot on rope fish is what I call the white spot of death disease. Generally, when rope fish first come in, one of the problems that you can see with them that is a real problem is these white patches and you'll see one of them and you go, eh, is that a thing? I don't know. Maybe he bumped himself, maybe he messed up his scales and then it'll become a white patch. And then 24 hours later, it'll be everywhere. And 48 hours later, it'll spread to your other rope fish. I've never seen it spread to another fish, just rope fish. And you have to act so quick on that in order to save your rope fish or else they're going to die. My advice, general cure and erythromycin immediately full dose hit them twice hit them three times if you have to don't stop doing it until they're healthy general cure and erythromycin i've actually used a double dose of erythromycin before just because things got really bad i've managed to save several of them but i've also lost many so that would be the white spot of death disease you'll know it if you see it and usually it only happens right when they're first brought in or right when they're transferred so it seems to happen at import and or when you transfer them to a new system of water. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, no, Kevin, you had a tank bust with orange baby Neos in it. Oh, I hate it when a tank busts. That is the stuff of my nightmares. When I first got back into the hobby and I set up that. Um, 36 gallon bow front that the puffers are in. I had a 40 gallon tall before that that I was working on, and I did my first fishless cycle, and it took forever like months of water testing multiple times a day. And I was so excited about it. And one morning, I walked into my living room, and darned it if that thing wasn't half full and all the water was draining into my basement. And I just cried and cried. And I called my mom, and I was like, Mom, Mom, it's it's horrible. There's water. It's, I don't know what to do with the rope fish and the thing and the plants. And God love my mom. She was like, you're getting an early Christmas present. And she bought me that 36-gallon bow front because they were on sale at PetSmart. And I was like, yay. Okay. We got 15 minutes left here, people. 15 more minutes. Tell me your fears. Tell me your woes. Tell me what you want to talk about. We can keep talking rope fish or bettas if you want to. We can talk about how we should all not be afraid of our mothballs and continue to be the good conservationists that we are, even if we do have mothballs, and how we don't need to destroy our entire aquariums just because we have mothballs, what, whatever you guys want to talk about. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, do 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 do. Let's see. Somebody is dreaming about ponds in the living room. Um, are my headphones muted? I hope not. Okay. My thing just flashed something at me, and I don't know how it works. If you can hear me, let me know. Florida Fish Rescue set up the 90-gallon puffer tank last week, spent $100 on plumbing, and the sump and overflow filled it, and the left edge had cracked and leaked like a waterfall, and now I'm waiting on acrylic for glue. Oh, man. I It's the stuff of nightmares for fish keepers. Anybody else, if you hear a water sound in your house that is not a normal water sound, it like immediately puts you on edge and you start looking for the drip. Anybody else? Oh, other updates. Um, I put all my lights on timers finally. Thank you for the super chats for my last live stream because uh, I was able to purchase the uh, light timers that I needed. So now all my lights are on timers and I'm not used to that. And I was standing in my kitchen alone and everything was bright and I was making a cup of coffee and then all of a sudden all the lights in the house went off. And I was like, what is going on? And I got real nervous. And then I realized, oh, it's my light timer's going on. Derp. <laughs> stupid moment. I had a stupid moment. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I just scared the bejesus out of myself for no reason. And then I was like, oh, cool. I don't have to go around turning all the lights off. What a cool thing this is. Light ghosts, right? This is the light ghost. Jason says your pond looks really good. Thank you. I just added more isopods to it because the mold situation is getting for real. And the springtails are on the incline. So the springtails should be helping with that situation. Current problem is the ants have arrived back for the spring, which means I now have to figure out how to stop this colony of ants from deciding that my pond is a playground. <clears throat> collaboration of curiosities finally no more stagging around in the dark turning everything on and off right except now it scares me all the time because i'm like oh the lights are on oh the lights are on i'm getting used to it though i kind of like it john mckenzie with the five dollar rope fish breeding fund thank you so much we're about to build a new pond in the basement and i'm going to try to get that pond kit that greg woodstock owes me the Just Shrimp Granny gave me at Aquashella. And I'm going to try to get that installed in the backyard and put like a fence around it with all my kids like play stuff so that she has an area back there where like our bunny can play and she can go outside and like the guinea pig can come outside. By the way, we also have a rabbit named Food and a guinea pig named Chocolate and a crazy dog named Everest and two cats. My house is a zoo. My house is a zoo. Patty says, sprinkling cinnamon works for me every year with the ant invasion. That is what I did last year to keep them out of there. I put a circle, like I was doing some kind of weird seance, around my pond of cinnamon. However, this year I have the dog, and I, I'm trying not to have, like, cinnamon on my floor. And, you know, be like, I'm, I'm pretty OCD, so that affected me a little bit. Um, What, what else, what else? Carrie said she found a snake in her koi pond this morning. Well, I hope it was a small snake, and I hope it didn't hurt your koi. But also, that's pretty cool, and I hope you filmed it. Florida Fish Rescue says diatomaceous earth will kill the ants and not harm the fish. Yeah, but it might harm my other insects that are in there, because I have springtails and isopods that I think it would be a problem for. And also, I don't necessarily want to kill the ants. Like, I'm down with ants. I watch Ants Canada. I find them fascinating. They're little colonies. They talk to each other, eat out of each other's mouths. I think they're awesome. I don't want to kill them. I just don't want them in my pond. If I wanted ants in my pond, I would have got a specific colony of ants, put it in the pond. But these ants don't understand that because they're just crazy sugar ants looking for a crumb. And I swept up all the crumbs, so they're like, let's go try out this pond. Crazy. Do 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 do. Okay, what else do we got here? We got ten more minutes. Um, set the timer so they don't all go off at once and scare you. That's a good idea, muddy muddy boots. I should try that. Rick says I just upgraded the Aqua Aquaski 2.0 to the Planet 3.0 in my 75, and I can finally grow hair grass. The new light is like night and day with plant growth with that 75 gallon depth. Yeah, new lights are always better. It doesn't even matter what kind of light it is. It's going to eventually start to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And you're going to have to replace it. Which is why 
I like to use $17 shop lights from Walmart because they are strong enough to grow highlight plants. They are dim enough in the right areas to grow low light plants. And when they fade, it doesn't cost me a million dollars to replace them. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh man, Chad just jumped on me. Jumped real high. Argentine ants are highly invasive. The largest colonies in the U.S. and Western Europe worldwide invasive. Yeah, ants can be invasive. All kinds of things can be invasive. Your best bet is not to take one thing from one location and put it in another location. Even if it's like I went and visited this state and I took a rock from there or I took a tree branch from there and then I took it home and I put it out in my backyard. Bad idea. Now, you go visit another state, you find a rock that you like and you want to put it in your aquarium, perfectly fine. Wash it, do the right things. But don't then take that rock and put it outside. That's it. That's all, that's all you have to know. Diatomaceous earth is the answer. It might It might very well be the answer. Um, Rooted Tank said, can you go over the quarantine process for marmol balls? Game and Fish contacted us. Okay, so this is for aquatic arts marmol balls. This is how we deal at, with these at aquatic arts. They're imported dry. That process takes two to three weeks to get them here. After two to three weeks, basically dry, not many things can survive in that, including these zebra mussels who can only last up to seven days out of water. Then we wait another two to three weeks before we even unbox them. So they sit in the boxes, in the dark, in the dry for two to three more weeks before we even pull them out. Then we put them into the high salt bath, which is 60 to 60 percent above seawater. And they stay there for 24 hours. We're also adding cupramine in at this stage. Then they get pulled out of that after 24 hours and rinsed in fresh water and spun out in this modified high efficiency washing machine. Then they get hand inspected as they're put into our brackish holding tanks. So at this point, nothing brackish, nothing salt water, nothing fresh water, nothing Nothing should be alive in them at this point, and we have never found anything alive in them at this point. We've found shells. We actually have never even found the flesh of these mussels. We've only found the shells because our process is so good that it, it just eliminates them. So then they go into our brackish holding tanks, and before they get shipped out, so our pre-sale process is they get rinsed again, final wash and inspection before they're packaged up and sent to you guys. And that's to everyone. That's anything that leaves our holding tanks. So if you're buying large quantities from us and, and doing things like that, if you're buying directly from us, all of that. I hope that made a lot of sense. And, and we showed that process to Fish and Wildlife, and they are fully on board. And the owner of Aquatic Arts actually shared that process with our supplier, who is now implementing that salt bath before the import process begins. So we're trying to make it even better as we go along. We're always, the one thing I will tell you about aquatic arts is that they are always in it for the better of the hobby. We're currently working on building a giant shrimp breeding facility so that we can stop having imported shrimp and start being the first or the largest breeder of USA bred shrimp in the country. Um, because we don't want to have to, we want to be in control of the quality of our shrimp and what they're being raised in and what's coming in with them and things like that. So we're working on that. We're also working on building a giant new facility. <clears throat> we just got the building for it. That's going to have a retail location. We're going to branch out into salt water and we're going to do a bunch of stuff with coral propagation so that we can stop bringing things in from actual coral reefs. Well, we don't do that now because we don't do salt water, but once we get into it, we're not going to be bringing in things that are affecting ecosystems. We're going to be propagating our own. So every process that, that has been done since these guys started in a basement breeding cherry shrimp. So, I mean, we're talking about a company, Aquatic Arts, who started in a basement breeding cherry shrimp. And everything they've done to scale what they're doing has been in an effort to try to advance not only what you can get in the hobby, 
but how well it's done. Quarantining, moving forward with these big projects, all of this, and how we handle plants that come into our facility. And huge shout out to David for sharing that process with the community because it's technically a trade secret. So the fact that he's more concerned about conservation and helping other people be as good at conservation as we are speaks very high volumes for somebody that could very easily just hold that information and say, no, it's a trade secret. So super, super awesome. Um, great process. All of that, blah, blah, blah. Rocco says, I've never ordered from there, but now I think I should try them out. You absolutely should. Use my coupon code. I don't want to do commercials again, but I'm sure Bob Kaler will put it in the uh, chat. Let's see. Between the fire ants and the green ants, we can't use our yard. Yeah, Australia's crazy. Y'all have some crazy stuff. Let's see. What else did I miss? Okay, went over the quarantine process, all of that for what Aquatic Arts is doing. Um, do 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 do. Anyways, we got three more minutes. Three more minutes. I can probably ramble one more question if you would like to, and I would love to answer anything else you guys have. We got all kinds of people in here. Sean OTD, what is up, sir? How is it going? Look at all these fine people in here. Are you guys living your best lives? You better be. I'm living my best life. I'm real tired, but I'm living my best life. And I keep hearing rope fish take gulps of air over here. By the way, there's four rope fish in there. This dream said, are they breeding bristlenose? I would love to see commons phased out of the hobby. We purchase a lot of tank bred bristlenose. They purchase them from me. They purchase them from other breeders in our area. If we can find an avenue at Aquatic Arts to purchase something tank bred instead of importing it, we'll do it every time. Just just because it's it's going to be a better it's going to be a better, healthier, less stressed animal, and we would rather deal with a better, healthier, less stressed animal in our facilities and also we'd rather send you a better animal. Not that imports are bad animals. There's something to be said for importing. It's a good it's a good thing that we can do and it can be done correctly. And we try to do it to the best of our ability. We work really closely with all of our suppliers. And if we see practices that we don't like, we, we are in close contact with them to try to change it, to rearrange things. Like when we started bringing in those vampire crabs, um, there were a few issues in the import, not, not any big issues, but we had them change the way that they were packaging them. And then that got taken care of. Like, we're on top of this as far as making sure that health, safety, and conservation are priority number one with customer service just, just barely at number two. It might even also be at number one. I'd probably put that up there as well. Uh, do, 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 do. Sean wants to know when I'm getting shell dwellers. No cichlids. Hi. I don't keep cichlids. That's a rabbit hole I can't go down yet. I already ended up down this better rabbit hole. Um, the other Tiffany said, never had shrimp. Want to get some Amano's quarantine process for shrimp. Same as anything else. One to two weeks quarantine away from everybody else before you put them in your tank. If you have a standalone tank that has nothing in it, that's technically a quarantine tank. So if it's the first thing in, you're still quarantining. And keep an eye on them. There's drip acclimation processes you can use. You can look those up online. They also come in every box from Aquatic Arts. We put our acclimation process in. So you should have all the information that you need to do really, really well. And Amanos are super hardy. So I don't think you'll have a problem. Amanos are awesome. Fantastic for cleaning up hair algae. I have like six of them in one tank. And anytime I have a plant that won't stop growing algae. I just throw it in that tank for a couple of weeks and then I take it back out and put it where I want it. All right. We are at the one hour mark. Rocco says, oh my God, King Tiger Plecos. Yeah, we we do love the fancy Plecos at Aquatic Arts. Kind of, kind of a niche specialty that we like to play in. The fancy Plecos. Uh, 
Hard to know when I hear about QT med trio. You can do the med trio. There's nothing wrong with that. I just see that as blanket medicating. So the med trio is like the general cure erythromycin and some kind of ICX, right? And you can do that. That's a standard blanket treatment for any parasite, bacterial infection, anything that might come in on a fish. And it's all up to how you feel about it. Some people, as soon as they feel a headache, will take a Tylenol. Some people don't want to take any medication and they will fight a headache as long as they possibly can and do everything else they can first before they take a Tylenol. You have to decide what type of person you are. And neither one of those people is bad people. The people that do a blanket treatment are not doing it because they have some nefarious reason. They're doing it because they love their fish and they want to do what's right. Similarly, the people that don't use any chemicals or try as hard as they can not to use any medicines or chemicals also are trying to do what's right for their fish. Both people are admirable. It's just a different way to do something. It's not something you should judge somebody for. You can share how you do things or why you do things the way you do, but they may not share your opinion, and that's okay because we're allowed to disagree, you guys. We're allowed to do that. There's a million different ways to do something. There's a million different scenarios that will work out for one person that the same thing won't work out for another. And all you have to do is learn from what you hear and see, be nice to people, live your best life, and not worry about what other people are doing. So anyway, in conclusion, live your best life, enjoy your moss balls, Know that you're doing everything you can for conservation and that being an aquarium hobbyist actually puts you at the forefront of conservation. And don't ever let anybody make you feel bad for that because they aren't educated enough to know that what you're doing isn't wrong. Live your best life, you guys. I love you. Be good. See you later.